Hello to the Chess Chicos and the Chess Chicas. Today we are going to revisit the very shady world of swindling, but today we are going to put an extra spin on it. And uh, without further ado, I think the best I can do is if I jump right into our topic. Um, the other day I played a game, and when I say the other day in Australia, that can mean anything uh, between yesterday and the Wars of the Roses. So I don't exactly know when it was. But anyway, I played a Blitz game that went absolutely horrendously. Uh, let me show you how horrendously it went. I got a little bit funky with this G4 shenanigan and then I started playing really, really aggro, which of course is the only way to play chess if you want to do it right. And uh, at this point, I played a funky move that I kind of came to regret afterwards, which was Queen G4. I was a little bit uh, nervy about B4, 94. I don't know how right or wrong that uh, evaluation was. And I thought my queen was beautifully covered the pawn, and of course e5 is well met by knight f5. Why not coconut? My plan is h5, g6. Anyway, so yeah, it just looked like a marvelous plan. Famous last words there. Knight e2, bishop b7, I defended my little pony. Knight d7, I thought, okay, castle, here I come on your bike. <sighs> of course I'm dead lost already because of a5. Now, I saw none whatsoever wrong with my position even here, and I casually just went into h5, my opponent plays a4, I'm like, yeah, no whackers, uh, another Ozzin is there, meaning no worries, uh, I'm just gonna go bishop c4, and if uh, he pushes any of the point, if he pushes this, I push past, if he pushes this, I might even not respond and just play g6 and go for broke, and then lo and behold, 95 lands on the board, and I'm like, whoa, what that? Friend, what that? Uh, Uncle Roger would now tell me, hi yeah, like, man, don't you look after your pieces? And literally, as soon as this landed on the board, I'm like, okay, I'm resigning. And then, and then, for a split second, I noticed something on the board that I think is really, really instructive. Uh, and I really don't want to sound too corny in the way how I describe it, but what really made me stay in this game is, is that I noticed the concept and an idea that was purely based on the following observation, that once I move my queen and they take my bishop, my other bishop is going to hang as well. And then I thought, okay, so what if in this position I move my queen back, they take the bishop, I play g6. Please note, by the way, that whilst I'm saying this, I'm fully aware of the fact that I am 100% dead lost here with white. That's beside the point. Bear with me. Queen back knight c4. I'm gonna chuck g6 in. And then, if they take the bishop too, which looks like a very logical response, I'm gonna play h6. And that, if you guys are regular viewers of my chat, let's call that uh, YouTube channel, excuse me, you would know that I discussed this concept at multiple times with uh, Daniel Lona in many of our videos that I recently uploaded um, when we discussed king side attacks, opposite colored attacks and so on. However, there's a big difference here and that is this, that after take take g6 knight here and h6, this kind of lunging forward is very very typical in the English attack. However, in almost all cases in the English attack when it happens, the white queen is located on d2, and almost always there is a white bishop on e3, not so much a black knight, yep, so z for that, which makes this whole shebang far less effective, because if you picture now a position with a queen on d2 when I play g6, let's say I'm just playing doozies here, um, you know what, I will even relocate my queen to d2 to demonstrate this point the best I can. So if it was black to move now, you would see that after, let's say, fg6, pawn takes g7, they simply play rook f7, rather than committing to take, allowing the check. And now it's not so easy for white to continue this attack. There is still work to be done. However, in the game, my queen is on h3. So after takes g6, knight e3, when I play h6, they take g6, I take g7, with a mate threat on h7. 
And before I continue, because really fascinating stuff is to come, what I really want you to take away from this video, if nothing else, is, is that when things go pear-shaped on the board and you decide that there is a, a very faint glimmer of hope to stay in the game, it is your utmost interest to try to create as much chaos and as much imbalance on the board as possible. Now, in this regard, this game is not exactly a very good example because a lot of imbalances have already been created. What am I talking about? The castles are, sorry, the, uh, the kings are castled opposite side. Huge imbalance, huge imbalance right off the bat, right? There are a myriad attacking threats and motifs and ideas raining down on the black king. My king, in contrast, is perfectly safe. But I'm down five zillion points in terms of material. No matter what aspect you look at on the board, what you find is chaos and imbalance. There is no symmetry. Nothing is the same. Material is not the same. Our chances of attacking each other is not the same. Our king safety is not the same. There is not a single component on the board that black could grab onto and go like, yeah, that is it. That, that's how I'm going to, you know, steady the ship and cruise to victory. What it is now is chaos. It is fundamentally unsound. I know it. Bear with me. But this is how you come back into games. And if you see what happened in this game, you will agree with me that this is not as much of a long shot as it may have seemed prior. By the way, taking the bishop is not a mistake. But playing h6, he would have kept the game very, very clean for black. Because now after bishop f6, that king is so incredibly well protected. I have nothing there whatsoever. Anyway, so he took, I played h6. He took, I took. And now it is quite hairy. Black is winning, clearly. But boy, do they need to play some tricky moves. King takes was played. Takes. King f6. And here, black is actually completely winning despite the many promising attacking moves. Now, I'm not going to go into the analysis of those ideas, but I'm telling you it's very well worth for you to start an analysis from here because you are going to improve your calculating skills and your vision, everything immensely. I spent almost an entire lesson with a very gifted student of mine who has a very good knack for calculation and uh, um, tactics and attack and all that she bank is rated about 1900 fit if I recall rightly. Sorry, dude, if I got that wrong, by the way. And we calculated a zillion lines and almost all of them we found mistakes and holes in despite, you know, me controlling and monitoring what he was doing. It was a really fun exercise. Now imagine that in a game where it's not fun. If you make a mistake, you lose. As in, if you were black. So this is real rough. Anyway, rook g1 was played, rook g8 was played. Perfect by black so far. And I played here f4, which is a really, really bad move. But boy, did it allow to score me to score a nice win. The idea was purely to cut the king off on these squares and aim for some kind of a mate attack here. here. Um... But yeah, it is just uh, no bueno after bishop b4. I've got absolutely nothing here. But my opponent played rook g7. And here, ladies and gentlemen, I uncorked a tactic that is one of the nicest ideas I've ever played in my life. Hands down. I'm very proud of it. In fact, I tweeted this position a couple of hours ago. And that move was the immensely lovely rook g6, rook g6 and knight g3. That's a rook sack followed by a knight sack. But now the knight is immune to capture because it's mate here. And knight g3 has created the mate threat of knight h5. If at this point you don't start to panic with black, you are not made out of human. And here I thought, I genuinely thought when we got to here, I had 40 seconds against my opponent's 1 minute 3 seconds. I genuinely thought it was all over Red Rover. See ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. This is going to be the victory of the year. Not so. When I turn on the engine to my greatest dismay, it has shown me one of the most 
genius defense I've seen in a long time in one of the wildest lines you will come across. Opponent played rook, take, rook g5 and yeah, complete collapse trying to defend the mate on um, 9h5 and allowing the mate on g h6 instead. It's a very anti-climatic finish but one that you one could totally relate to seeing the looming threat of mate. It's like it's really hard to see how you can dodge this. Uh, and in fact, there is a beautiful mate here. After rook g7, knight check, king he check, king he, knight check. Denying the king's exit. And after bishop takes, we have mate here. So nothing seems to work until you look at the good old checks, captures and threats. And you find knight d3 check. Which threatens to take on f4. Conveniently destroying my mate threat. And if I take, here comes the absolutely shocking move. Rook a5. I'm going to actually tweet this and I'm going to probably tag uh, Jacob Agard and the killer chess training guys to see if they can figure this out because I think it's worthy of their attention. But it's just insane, man. And now they just cut off the mate threat. And after e5, of course, D is still mate. But the insanity is, is that after e5, rook takes e5, fe, king e5, queen g6, king takes d4, and black wins, there is no mate. <laughs> oh man, when the engine showed me this line, I went like, wow, that is altogether next level. Still, I won the game, and the only reason why I won the game was because I was willing to throw in the kitchen sink to create chaos and imbalance, your two mottos. So at this point, I noticed that this would be too much. And they actually bit more than what they could chew. And after H6, I genuinely thought that I had a 50-50 chance of coming back to this game or not. The reality is that the evaluation is about minus 8. But when you are having this position with black, you don't feel it to be minus 8. And I feel that from here on out, I really did put the pressure constantly on. Okay, I must admit, f4 was a complete lemon. That was terrible. And here, rook h6 or knight f4 would have been the appropriate way to continue the attack. When black would still need to play a number of accurate defensive moves. Probably knight f4 is best. I would say. Yeah, queen e8 and then... Yeah, it's a struggle with rook h6. Uh, then black has, of course, the stock standard king e5, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just insane. d4 is hanging, and uh, if I defend d4 in whatever way, uh, let's say I drop back, then d5 and the king escapes. Sheer insanity. But to find these moves is just surreal, man. And now, again, look at the desire to create chaos. That's it. It's pure chaos. And by the way, here, every single move loses for white by a measure of at least minus nine every single one except for this and then this so yeah that's ladies and gents how i suggest that you take on dead lost positions you try to create chaos obviously i was set up for a level of success in terms of many of the required criteria of imbalance that i described earlier king's castle opposite side ongoing attack helped me a lot but i feel still i, I still feel that i think this mention this idea of uh, the mentioned idea of creating chaos and just constantly keeping the opponent busy with various tactical pressure and tactical tricks was the way for me to come back and uh, we did manage i hope that this was a useful lesson for you guys i'm excited to have you back in the next video please don't forget to like this up to super thank me if you can and i will be back soon with the next video. Cheerio. Bye.